Uh, but good morning, my name is Ethan Thatcher. Uh, like David said, I'm Summit's resident intern here this summer, and today is my first ever sermon. I know, <laughs> oh, I, didn't mean, I did not get this applause in the first hour, wow, but certainly today I've been looking forward to, I'm glad you guys have been looking forward to it uh, too, but today is my first ever sermon, and there's two reasons I draw you to the fact that it is. Uh, the, first, I just, the first reason is just because I want to say thank you, uh, not just for allowing me to come to this beautiful county this summer, but... Uh, for allowing me to preach in your pulpit. It's certainly an honor, and I hope you know that it doesn't go unappreciated. I am very grateful, so thank you very much. Uh, But the second reason I say that today is my first ever sermon is because I have been plagued with fears of inadequacy, uh, with fears of not being fit, of not being equipped, of not being qualified or ready to do the work that I know the Lord has called me to do here in this county. And, And all these fears have kind of been wrapped up in the central question I've been asking the Lord of, Lord, who am I to do this? I mean, who am I at 20 years old to be speaking to people like Duff Pace over there who's over 60? And the only reason I say that is because if you're in this room and you're over 60, then that means that you're over three times my age. (laughs) And so who am I to speak to people like that? And when I realized I had these fears culminating in this question, I also realized that I wasn't alone, uh, that we all have this fear because we're human. And I say it's because we're human, because our human nature bears witness to us that we're ordinary. Uh, that we're nothing special, that we have ordinary talents, ordinary abilities, ordinary lives. And yet as Christians, we know we're called to do the supernatural, extraordinary work of God. And so because of this disconnect, we're all asking this who am I sort of question. Who are we to do the work of God? Who am I to do God's work on his behalf here on his planet? Our passage today is Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Uh, which depict Moses and his encounter with God through the burning bush. And it will be a joy for us to read this morning's passage uh, because Moses has the very same question. Uh, Because he's not saying, who am I that I should preach my first sermon at 20? But he is saying, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He has the very same question. And it will be a joy for us furthermore to read this passage this morning because not only does Moses have the same question as us, but God answers Moses' question. And so if we have the same question as Moses, this who am I sort of question, then God's answer to Moses is also an answer to us. And so it will be a joy to read this passage this morning. And let's do that now. Exodus chapter 3, starting in verse 1. We'll go to verse 15. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he, I'm sorry, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, but I will be with you. And this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I'm to be remembered throughout all generations. This is the word of God. 
And so like we said before the reading of this text, uh, the question that both we and Moses share is this who am I sort of question. And Moses' rendition of this question is found in verse 11. And he says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And so knowing that we have the same question as Moses and knowing that God answers Moses' question, maybe we'd want to skip right to that portion of the text and just see what God has to say to us. Uh, but we can't do that quite yet. There is some background information we must go over so that when we get to this portion of the text, it will be most clear to us. And so if you were here with Summit last week, you know that day when he was talking, he spoke on Moses and his experience in the Nile and how Moses floated down the river and he was found by Pharaoh's daughter. And indeed, he was raised in Pharaoh's daughter's household, an Egyptian household. Uh, but even though Moses was raised in an Egyptian household, he didn't really hold true to Egyptian culture or heritage because he held true to his Hebrew or Israelite heritage. And we know this because when he's grown up, he's in uh, the land of Egypt and he sees an Egyptian striking one of his own people, a Hebrew, an Israelite. He decides to murder the Egyptian and hide him in the sand. And so now Moses is a murderer of an Egyptian in the land of Egypt, probably not the safest place to be. And I think he realizes this because he flees from Egypt, flees from Pharaoh, and goes out into the wilderness of Midian. And in the wilderness of Midian, he kind of has this uh, witness protection program sort of lifestyle. I mean, he has a new wife. He has a new job as the shepherd of the field. He's simply living in a new way. And this is actually where our passage comes into play today. Uh, you see Moses, he's on the west side of the wilderness, keeping his flock over there next to what we hear in the text is next to the mountain of God called Horeb. And over there he sees the burning bush and the booming voice of God crying out of it, Moses, Moses. Now I hope I painted that background information, that picture, in such a way in which you realize that this is not a pleasant or welcoming scene for Moses. Uh, but in the truest sense, he is a murderer on the run and hiding from the, from the punishment that Pharaoh could justly put on him. And he's running out the wilderness of Midian, full of guilt, full of shame from the great sin he had committed. And God meets him there. He catches him. He finds him, almost like in the act, red-handed. And I think Moses realizes very quickly that he can escape the presence of Pharaoh, uh, but he cannot escape the presence of God. And now that he's in the presence of God, all of his feelings of not being good enough, of not measuring up, of not being the person he knows he should be. All of those feelings are being brought to the light in the presence of God, are being laid out, exposed before Almighty God. You know, Moses thinks he's been caught, thinks he's been found out. He thinks this is the end for him. And just like Moses is not the only one with the who am I question, but we ourselves ask the very same question, so Moses is not the only one with these fears and these thoughts and these doubts. But our consciences bear witness to us that we're not good enough, that we don't measure up, that we're not the person we know we should be. And this experience that Moses is having in this passage is what we dread is coming for ourselves. Because our conscience tells us that we one day will have to give an account for our life, that we too will be exposed, laid out before the presence of God Almighty. And in that day, we will receive due punishment for our moral failure in this life. And, and the only way we could think this about ourselves, the only way that our conscience could possibly bear us witness about this within our internal convictions, is if there's a standard of good, a standard of morality that is in our heart, that's been given to us, that's been written on our heart, that's been inscribed on our minds. And this is very much the case, there is. But what's worse is that that standard of morality, that standard of good that is within our hearts, that's inscribed on in our minds, is none other than the perfect nature and character of God. It is his morality that is upon our hearts. And that is a problem for us because we will never measure up to that standard. We will always feel like a lesser than because he's God. He's perfect, holy, and righteous. And we don't meet that standard. We're sinful, we're wicked, we're conceited. And not only that, but if it's God's morality that is upon our hearts, we realize that we don't just have to be in the physical presence of God to feel these burdens, but only we have to be in the moral presence of God. And the moral presence of God follows us wherever we go because it's written on our hearts. And so as a result, it seems as if there's this judge hanging over our heads and in our hearts, reminding us of these realities that we're not good enough, that we don't measure up, that we're not the person we know we should be, and therefore burdening us. And not only these present realities, but also the reality that is to come, that one day we ourselves will be exposed in the presence of God. It seems as if there's a judge reminding us of that constantly. And with all this information in mind about the feelings and the problem that we have, 
and with all the information we know about Moses' feelings and Moses' problem, because we know they're all the same, in light of all of the information that we've been talking about thus far, we can actually answer one of the most common questions that the modern reader has when they come across a passage such as Exodus 3. And that question is namely, why does God come as he does? I mean, why the booming voice? Why the threatening, towering flames? Why the command to take off his sandals for the place on which he is standing is holy ground? It seems so threatening. It seems so harsh. And it is. But, but it seems so threatening and it seems so harsh because our fears are true. Because they're not just figments of our imagination that we've just created out of thin air, but rather they are realizations of fact that have substantial validity to them. We are not good enough. We don't measure up. We are not the person we know we should be. And there very much is a day that is coming in which we cannot escape, a day of judgment in which we will be punished for our moral failure in this life. And because this is all actually true, because this is not just a figment of our imagination, but it is actually valid, we are fundamentally at odds with who God is. For like we said, he is holy, righteous, and pure. And we don't meet that standard. We're sinful. We're wicked. We're conceited. And because of that, because of the stark contrast between us, we cannot cohabitate peacefully with him. For if he gets close to us, it would be dangerous for us. Think of the sun. The sun brings light and life to our planet, but if we get too close to the sun, it is dangerous for us. It will kill us. It will burn us up to death. Same it is with the presence of God. We can enjoy its benefits and its blessings from a distance, but if we get too close to the presence of God, it is dangerous for us. It would, in a sense, purify us to death, not because he's so bad, but because he's so good, because we're so bad, because the contrast is too stark. And so I know I haven't actually gotten closer to the solution of our question or our problem this morning, our who am I sort of question, but if anything, I've made the problem worse. I've magnified the problem because we're not just unfit, we are unclean. We're not just unequipped, we are defiled, stained from ever doing the work of a holy God, let alone be in his presence. We know this. Our internal conscience reminds us that we know this. Moses knows this, and I know that Moses knows this, because in verse 6 of this passage, it says that he is utterly afraid to even look at the face of God. Moses thinks he's going to be utterly destroyed in this moment. But if you've read this passage before, you know that's not the case. In fact, it only takes one reading of this passage to realize that, no, the Lord does not want to destroy Moses. He doesn't want to destroy Israel. He wants to deliver them. We see in verses 7, 8, and 9 that the Lord has seen the affliction of the people. He's heard their cries and he knows their sufferings. And in light of all of that, he has come not to destroy, but to deliver him and his people. This would have brought great joy for Moses. This would have made him thrilled, elated, excited, because it has been 430 years that Israel has been in concentration camp-like slavery. Like we talked about last week, it was so bad, the best choice scenario for Moses' mom was the fact that she had to push Moses down a river. I mean, this is hellish in a sense, and so Moses would have been elated with the fact that God has finally come to not destroy them, but to deliver them. And so in a sense, Moses can exhale until he reads, or he hears, what God says to him, which is recorded for us in verse 10 of this passage. Verse 10 would have made Moses tense up again inside, and so let's read verse 10. Verse 10 reads like this, Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. This would have been appalling for Moses. This would have been shocking for him, because he knows who God is, and he also knows who he is. And, and like we talked about earlier, he understands the discrepancy between the two. He knows that the God that is talking to him now is the same God in Genesis chapter 1 that said, let there be light, and there simply was. His voice deems action. That's how, he, that's how powerful he knows God is. And he knows that that God could show up in this scenario and do the very same thing. Let Egypt, let Pharaoh be plundered. Let Israel be delivered. And it would simply happen at the sound of his voice. He knows how powerful God is. But he also knows who he is. He knows that everything we've been saying about ourselves this morning is also true of him. And he understands the discrepancy. And so he is baffled by the fact that God would want to use him. And all these thoughts that he's having are wrapped up in this question. 
This question in verse 11 that we know we also ask ourselves, this who am I sort of question. And for Moses, it's who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? But like we said, it's a joy for us to continue studying this passage because God answers Moses' question. And in fact, God's answer is found in verse 12 of this morning's passage. So let's read verse 12, God's response to not only Moses, but our question. Verse 12. He said, but I will be with you. He said, but I will be with you. Now, that might not seem like an answer to Moses' question because Moses didn't ask about who the Lord was or the fact that he goes with him. He said, no, Lord, who am I? Who am I that I should do your work on your behalf here on your planet that you have made? But this is very much an answer to Moses' question. It's a direct answer to who he is or to, to the question. And in fact, more so than just being a direct answer, it is the most liberating answer that God could have possibly given Moses in this moment. For he's trying to communicate to Moses that he has the wrong question. God says, Moses, it's not about who you are. It's not on the matter of who you are. For if it was, you're right. I wouldn't even be talking to you right now. But it's not on the matter or basis of who you are, Moses. It's on the matter and basis of who I am. And once you take your eyes off of yourself and put them onto me and see how great and grand and big and beautiful I am and of value and of treasure that I am, my promises to you in Scripture will mean everything to you. For how can the promise of God mean anything to us if we don't have great thoughts of God? And so Moses is saying, I'm sorry, God is saying to Moses, you have the wrong question. You need not focus on you, but rather on me. And once you do that, my command that I go with you in the work that I call you to do will be utterly, infinitely comforting and infinitely transforming. And so that is true of us as well. We have the wrong question. What we should be asking, it seems like a big question. Who is God? (laughs) Who is God? And more specifically, what is God like because we need to look at him. Then once we see how amazing he is, when he goes with us, it'll mean everything to us. It'll be the end of the conversation because that's the answer to our question. Our question was, who am I to do the work of God? And God's answer to us is that he's going to go with us. And so I could close my Bible and I've been here for a couple weeks. You guys, you guys can close down the cloverleaf in like 30 minutes. So it could be dark in this room in 30 minutes. Uh, but there's still a disconnect. There's still a condition that we have to understand, and that is we have to know who God is. And so that's the question laid before us now. Who is God? What is he like? Well, luckily, this isn't a question that we have to lose sleep over or a question that we have to search the entire New Testament to find out, but rather it's the very next question that Moses asked God in this passage. Verse 13 is Moses' second question to God. And so let's read verse 13. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Proper question. And just like Moses' first question that was proper, God answers it right away, following verse. And so he's going to do the same thing here. Verse 14 is God's answer to Moses' second question. Verse 14 reads like this. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. I am who I am. If that's the name of God, that is a very weird name. I'm glad that Dave and Jenna named their kid Kate and not I am who I am because she would have been ridiculed her entire life because we all know at the end of the day that I am who I am is a silly name. And it seems that way because it's not a name. Because it's not the name of God. Because the name of God is coming, God will answer Moses' question. His name is in verse 15. He could, and we could talk about it too. His name is the Lord. His name is Yahweh. Uh, but I think there's something more important going on here. There's a reason that he doesn't say his name right away. Because I think this I am who I am is more important. is more foundational to who God is and what matters in this moment. And so that exactly is what the I am who I am is. It's not a name. It's a foundation for who God is. Information so pivotal to his identity, so pivotal to his character that he says it before his very name. I am who I am. But even, even after you realize that it's not a name, okay, it's not a name, it's a foundation for who God is. Maybe I understand that. Even after you understand that, it might still seem weird. Uh, because I am who I am. And you are who you are, and aren't we all are who we all are? (laughs) And so what does this reveal to us about the nature and character of God? Well, in order for us to realize what this reveals to us about the character and nature of God, maybe it's best to look at what God did not say in this moment. 
learn by contrast. For instance, in this moment, God did not say, I am love. Or he did not say, I am justice, or I am peace, or I am mercy, or I am compassion, or I am wrath. Is it true that our God is all of these things? Well, of course he is. He's all of these things, and that's the catch. You can't just single out an attribute of God and throw away all the rest. That's not an accurate foundation for who he is, because he's all of these beautiful and amazing characteristics and attributes woven so perfectly together. And so what we realize is that this response to Moses in this moment, I am who I am, is the only possible response that could give Moses a proper and accurate foundation for who God is. And then in the following verse, we see God says to Moses, hey Moses, I want you to go to the leader of Egypt, Pharaoh, a leader of a nation full of gods, the sun, the moon, the trees, the grass, the stars, the Nile River, the sky, they're all gods to them. I want you to go to the leader of that kind of nation and say that you come on behalf of the God who simply is, period, above all these false and foolish idols of their land. See, Egypt was known to bifurcate. They were known to divide. They were known to make subsets of Almighty God. And it might seem weird to you that they do that, until you realize that we in 21st century America do the very same thing. We, we bifurcate, we divide, we make subsets of who God is. And normally we do that in order for God to fit us, in order for him to fit our circumstances. For instance, let's just say that we've messed up and we want God to forgive us. We don't want a God of wrath and justice. We would rather discard those attributes. We only want a God of love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness. Or... Think of another scenario. Let's say that someone else has messed up. We want God to pour justice upon them. We don't want a forgiving God, a loving and gracious and kind God. We want a God of wrath and justice only in that moment. But you see, we can't do that. It's a falsification to the identity of God. It is a rip to who he is. God did not say, I am who you want me to be, when you want me to be, how you want me to be. He said, I am who I am Period. Take it or leave it. Like it or not. This is who I am. Anything else is a lie. Amen. So that's what we have to understand. We can't make our own gods of our own imagination. We can't pick and choose out of scripture to create our own gods. But rather we have to look and see who God says he is and see that as beautiful. To see that as lovely and of treasure and of value. And when we see him, his self-proclaimed identity as beautiful, the fact that he goes with us will mean everything to us. Well, luckily, it is easier to find God for who he says is beautiful than finding your own God's beautiful. Because God, the I am who I am, is the most beautiful thing on the face of the universe. He is the definition of beauty. So it's not hard at all to see God as beautiful in and of himself because he is the most beautiful thing we could ever even set our eyes upon. And so we just have to realize, we just have to recognize, we just have to remember who God is and what it means for God to be who he says he is as the great I am. What does it mean for God to be the great I am? We just have to remember what it means for God to be such. And then we'll see him as utterly beautiful. For instance, when God says that he's the great I am, he means in a sense, in one way, that he has no beginning or end. That he did not begin, he did not end, he rules and reigns forever. The word, his word will remain forever. That he exists eternally. And that we never have to be worried about him losing power or dying off or being vaporized into nothingness because he reigns forever. That's what we have to realize when God says he's the great I am. Or, or again, secondly, if only we or Moses would realize that when God says he's the great I am, it means that he is the absolute reality. That there are no other gods, there are no other I am's, but he is the only one. And that is a comfort to us because we need not pledge our allegiance to anyone else but the great I am who is our God, who is our Lord. See, if only we would realize that when God says who he is as the great I am. Thirdly and lastly, if only we or Moses would realize that when God says he's the great I am, it means that he is the absolute, I'm sorry, it means that he is utterly independent. And if he is utterly independent, that means that we are utterly dependent on him. And so that is a comfort to us because everything we need, our all in all is to be found in one source, and that is God. You see, the name is not the focus of what's going on here. The I am who I am, the foundation, is far more important for seeing God as beautiful. And that's exactly what we and Moses need to do in order for his commands in Scripture to mean anything to us. Don't you see how this great I am is the only comforter? 
that no other gods that we like to create or on our own could never comfort and could never tra- transform us like the great I am can. So we need not look to ourselves, but look to who God is. And so you could say that the ultimate answer of our who am I question is God saying, no, I am who. God is the I am who of our who am I, because once we turn to who God is as the great I am, we'll see him as beautiful. And therefore his commands will be sweet to us. We'll never want to forget them because they'll mean everything to us. But there's still a problem this morning. Because the problem that we introduced at the beginning of this sermon still holds true. It has no way been mitigated. How are we going to stand in the presence of a holy God? Because sure, uh, God can comfort me and transform me by promising to go with me. But if I get close to God, didn't we say that's dangerous? Didn't he say he's too holy for us? He'd purify us to death? That's very much the case. And so this comfort is superficial. It is meaningless. It is worthless if we can't stand in the presence of a holy God. And so how are we going to stand in the presence of a holy God? Well, something I didn't say in the first service, but I think is so beautiful when I was realizing it, is that God could have done nothing. And we could have eternally stand condemned in his presence. He didn't have to reach out. He could have just remained aloof. He could have remained distant, but he didn't. Because the reason we can stand in the presence of a holy God is because God did not just come in the form of a bush, but he came in the form of a man. That the I am, the great I am, the I am who I am did not just come in the form of a bush, but he ultimately came in the form of a man and the man, Jesus Christ. And so that might seem overarching and not relevant to our passage today, but it very much is. Because if God did not just come in the form of a bush, but he ultimately came in the form of the man and the man, Jesus Christ, it means that God never commanded Moses to do anything that he wouldn't ultimately do himself in the person of Jesus Christ. If God did not, if God did not just come in the form of a bush, but came in the form of a man, it means that he never commanded Moses to do anything that he wouldn't ultimately do himself in the person of Jesus Christ. For Just as Moses, we see he's in the court of Pharaoh later in the book of Exodus. So Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, was in the court of Caiaphas, the high priest, the night of his arrest and awaiting his crucifixion. Moses, court of Pharaoh, Jesus, court of Caiaphas. The sinful Moses receives deliverance, like we see in the book. But the sinless son of God receives death. And so they seem like two similar scenarios, but they have a logical and opposite outcomes. How is it that the sinful Moses receives deliverance, but the sinless Son of God receives death? How do we reconcile these two? We do it like this. Moses received deliverance because Jesus received death. Jesus received death so that Moses could receive deliverance. And I'm not talking about deliverance recorded in the book of Exodus. I'm talking about deliverance through the ultimate Exodus. Not fleeing from the oppressive power of slavery in Egypt, to which the Israelites were slaves, but fleeing from the oppressive power of sin and death all over the world and in our hearts, to which we are all slaves. Because of the work of Christ on our behalf, he has granted for us that sort of ultimate deliverance. And it is because of the work of Christ that we can say along with Pastor Timothy Keller that the gospel is this, that we are more sinful and flawed than we ever dared imagine. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. And so that judge that hangs over our heads and in our hearts that we talked about earlier, if you are in Christ, he can no longer touch you. He is gone because Christ has paid the price of you with his blood. Because he is satisfied with the blood of Christ on your behalf and will not touch you. And so because of this newfound reality of the gospel, we can say along with Paul in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, that there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, in Exodus 3, we see Moses looking into a plain old bush uh, that becomes exceedingly great because of the fire that was lit within it. But little did Moses know that he was metaphorically looking into a mirror. Uh, For just as this bush had nothing inherently special of itself, so Moses was a murderer on the run with nothing inherently special about himself. Uh, But just as this this bush was used to speak the voice of God and was lit with a fire inside that did not consume, so Moses would become a mouthpiece for the voice of God among the people of Israel. 
and would be lit with a fire inside that would not consume him, but would rather comfort him and carry him throughout all the days of his life and into eternity. You see, just as Moses was ultimately comforted by the fact that the great I am goes with him and yet he's not consumed, so we can be ultimately comforted by the fact that the great I am goes with us and that because of the work of Christ on our behalf, because of the imputation of his righteousness to our life, we too will not be consumed if we're found in him. And so who are we to do the work of God? Nothing. We are nothing to do the work of God. Wrong question. A relevant topic of discussion. We are nothing to do the work of God, but we can be an ordinary bush that is used by God and therefore lit with his spirit inside of us. A spirit that will not consume us because Christ was consumed on our behalf. Now because of the work of Christ, it can be a spirit inside of us that comforts us all the days of our life. In light of this truth, the band's going to come on up and sing one final song for us this morning. It is my hope and prayer that during this time and throughout this week, we would not look unto ourselves, but look unto who God is, both manifested in the great I am and in his son, Jesus Christ, who became a man. Let's pray. Our Father, we praise you for who you are and we thank you for what you've done in the person of Christ. Lord, something that we could have never done for ourselves, you have done for us. And Lord, might we not live as if the scripture is a lie? Might we live as if this passage is true? Might we know that we're ultimately comforted and transformed by the fact that you go with us? And Lord, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we would not look to ourselves, but look to you. And Lord, once we do that, your promises and scripture will be everything to us. Your scripture will be sweet to us as drippings from the honeycomb, like your word says. And so Lord, bind this word to our hearts this week. Uh, guide us as you so see fit, as you make much of yourself in our eyes, we pray. And we pray this all in the name of Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.